Morning all, let's have a look at round 8, the clash between Vladimir Kramnik playing white against Garwin Jones playing black. Vladimir kicked off with knight f3. This is a bit of a chameleon type move. It's very very difficult to prepare for if you're playing black I believe because white can choose all sorts of options. If for example you play c5, white can choose a Sicilian defence. If as black uh, you play also, of course, there's English opening if white wants. On g6, there could be a perk. So it's a bit of a tricky move to sort of play against. And Gwen plays c5. And in fact, the psychological aspects of this comedian type opening are revealed here because um, Vladimir, in his post mortem uh, commentaries, indicated he wanted to somehow discourage Fianchetto of this bishop. And this next move. Is not e4 or c4, but shows even the greater versatility of knight f3, believe it or not. b3. He might think if he wanted to play b3 immediately, why, why didn't he do it immediately before uh, knight f3? Well, on one on move 1b3, there's e5. If we go back, if white played 1b3, uh, this, this is a good kind of system. So this is quite a tricky move order to get the move b3 in an anti fianchetto system basically. And so Gwen's already been wrong footed right from the start uh, in effect here. He's now perhaps in, in less familiar territory. He plays d5 and White has a strategic plan of strengthening the grip on these dark squares, particularly e5 of course and d4. So he plays e3 which seems fairly logical. But even this move doesn't necessarily imply this bishop will be used on this diagonal. It can still fianchetto, believe it or not. This 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 pawn move can be used just to try and fix d5 later. Uh, so let's see, knight f6, which seems fairly logical and standard. Bishop b2, eyeing these dark squares. So this dark, dark square grip is evident, e6. And now, okay, the second slight, maybe you, you might consider this a surprise, but with e6, black has hemmed in this bishop already. So is is that already some sort of um, compromise? Uh, mind you, if the bishop did go to g4, then the option of bishop b5 check might be more effective than following up with, say, h3, g4, and knight e5 if the bishop goes back to h5. So this is really quite tricky for black to play accurately and try and maintain the personality that of, of position that Gowin likes and excels in. So with e6 he, he is closing up this bishop. Now without the possibility of bishop g4, bishop b5 being less effective, we see the move g3. And I guess sometimes this could, could be easily criticised that weakening all these, these light squares. But here, how are these light square weaknesses actually exploited in this particular position? Well it's maintaining a grip on the dark squares. And this Fianchetto could be useful to target d5 later. Let's see, knight c6, bishop g2, bishop e7, and both sides castle. And now we see the move c4. And the immediate thing, which you might think, well, d4 gaining space, but it's, it's going into an undermining scenario, perhaps, that black really doesn't want. Uh, you know, if taking white would get maybe the e file uh, and operations for a3, b4, like a reverse Benoni with a, a queenside pawn majority. So d4 carries some controversy with it. But the way this is played now with b6 is also, it needs to be played exceptionally accurately. Knight c3, and after bishop b7, we see the move c takes d5 and it's here black really has to play accurately and perhaps consider knight takes d5 instead of e takes d5 for example now in the game e takes d5 is, was played knight d5 vladimir's fa faced before in a blitz tournament uh, against a fellow uh, russian i believe he was talking in the post-mortem um and that I think that's that might be the more theoretical move to play knight takes d5, uh, because what happens now is after e takes d5 d4, somehow black hasn't got an ideal placement here. Uh, there's some nagging pressure with this knight on d5, 
and maybe like a move like knight e5 might be dangerous as well and with with black's next move okay he's trying to resolve some of these issues and he plays knight e4 okay now clearly t taking would lead to d4 being totally under fire vladimir just takes now on c5 exposing frontal attack intentions on d5 and it's already it's really quite an uncomfortable position but um tactically you know things like bishop f6 needs to be factored in here and we'll check in the second pass if there's any other alternatives apart from these routine seemingly routine captures uh, but um b takes c5 wasn't played actually it was knight takes c3 and it looks as though okay with this knight exchange you might think less pressure on d5 black doesn't really want an isolated queen's pawn he keeps both pawns together so they're called like hanging pawns and with the hanging pawns the issue is you know will they be fixed uh pretty soon there's also um there's still you know this this d file really is a basis for frontal attack now with this move queen e2 this shows great versatility because now there's potential for queen b2 probing and trying to encourage an ugly looking move like f6 or inflicting structural damage because if the knight was on d7 this is why black might be misplaced here with this knight on c6 as vladimir was suggesting in the post-mortem if the knight was on d7 something like bishop f6 wouldn't carry with it structural damage so queen b2 here might actually be uh, a threat which really black needs to deal with somehow as well as queen b5 and of course rook d1 coming up to attack d5 so this next move seems to be addressing in particular queen b2 to be able to answer by bishop f8 but um Vladimir doesn't go with queen b2 he just plays rook fd1 and we see now bishop f8 anyway so that could be useful this this pressure here for d4 potentially but now forcing move queen b5 is played and it's still it's still really quite tricky for black here you might think well what's the point of queen b5 surely you know rook rook b8 um, might be possible in this position and we'll check this out in the second pass if rook b8 is actually uh, playable or if white has some sort of frontal pressure here to exploit on d5 in the game now we we see what seems to be um, a, a tactically justified move from Gwen. this is only move 16 but he's outside of familiar territory and the move is queen b6 and you might think well isn't black uh offering that d5 pawn can it be taken is it a trap to take it well vladimir he takes on b6 and he doesn't consider taking the pawn on d5 to be a trap and you might think well surely it's a trap because for example knight d4 then you've got the bishop pressurizing d5 and knight takes f3 to follow and after all there's you know some weakened knight squares well here is where options are often broadened by sacrifices especially positional sacrifices so looking beyond the obvious with positional sacrifices vladimir did play actually rook takes d5 he is knocking out an important central pawn so what's the idea here what's the concept knight d4 is played uh, exposing an attack there on knight e5 there's rook takes e5 it's, it's no big deal so knight d4 okay is this is this the punishment well the problem is white just takes on d4 here and is collecting two pawns now for the exchange sacrifice it is actually an exchange sack and also these bishops are nicely centralized and attacking a8 here c takes d bishop takes so two pawns for the exchange it's a difficult position already for black to play or find much counterplay in fact white's plan is basically to steadily advance and then get his king infiltrating into black's position let's see how this goes so rook a5 asking for e4 straight away which does weaken c5 and that's made use of so black's fighting still bishop c3 now very interesting move rook a3 
This rook's evicted from there. Rook a7, keeping some pressure on a2 at least. But for the moment, you know, white controls the position quite a lot uh, with that huge bishop on d5, making black's rook's coordination very difficult here. We see now a4. White's plan is pretty clear to play something like this b4, a5, a6. And that'll be a very well supported pawn. And then the king can march into the position. We see rook c7. And now a very clever move uh, against black's potential threats of infiltrating on this second rank and wanting to keep the rook on. That's the important thing. White really wants to keep the rook on so that um, the king can just later infiltrate and keep a lot of pressure. And behind this pawn, it's very dangerous as well. So this next move is kind of prophylaxis and also attacking at the same time. It's the move rook a2. Okay, so rook a2, you might think, what on earth is this? It's kind of protecting f2 in certain circumstances, which could be dangerous. We see h6 from grain, king g2, king h7, and now f4. And white's gaining space now, and the king's coming in, king f3, rook d7. And here there's, there is a slight concern about rook d5s, rook e3, or trying to pin this bishop to the rook. So I believe here it's Vladimir's adapting his plan. He's, he's not going with the past a pawn plan, but instead in this position, adapting his plan with a5. So being forced to adapt here, but he's still maintaining a strong advantage. After b takes, rook takes a5. Black's rooks are still tied up defensively. Rook b5, getting onto the light squares. Now rook b7, okay. After rook b6, still preserving the rook with rook f7. He's not interested in rook exchange. This rook's more dangerous also with, with these bishops, you know, threatening, for example, bishop f6, if this, this rook wasn't defending f6. So it, it is huge pressure with the bishop pair and the rook against black's king as well. Rook f8, again, refusing the exchange of a rook. Okay, the rook's getting kicked about a bit. But now centralizing a bishop here cutting down black's options. Bishop c5, this pawn is now ready to roll as well. The king is coming in as well. h4, and now also an idea is to try and fix these pawns, especially like this one, just to cut down black's resources. b4, exposing the attack on the rook, as well as getting this pawn going. h5, fixing black's pawns. It's really an exercise in reducing counterplay from black. Rook c3, we see bishop d4 now threatening bishop f6. So this has to be parried. So we see this rook c7. And it's here that Vladimir doesn't mind finally exchanging uh, rooks here because he can see that his king can now come into the position onto the light squares with king f5. Black's really quite helpless here. This king's kind of stuck. The bishops are also stopping the king coming out. Bishop d6, the pawn is pushed. Rook c1, b6, the pawn is again pushed. King e6, the writing's really on the wall here. After rook h1, bishop c5. Black has actually had enough here. If he takes this pawn, it's pretty futile. This king looks absolutely menacing. An impressive control game from Vladimir. Black resigning here. Let's check with engine evaluation just to make sure of that. The, visually there's just no counterplay really. If if we take this pawn, maybe king king d seven's not actually the best move. Maybe bishop d six actually, just forcibly getting that bishop off. Okay, even better. And this pawn is just unstoppable here. Because that king is just just helping the pawn queen. King c seven's good, but even e five is good for a second pass pawn. It's just overwhelming for the one rook. So really, I mean, it's it's such an impressive game for avoidance of opening theory, if nothing else. Let's let's do some reference checks on the move b3 here, just on the second move. Has has b3 played been played with with a huge uh, statistical success in this position? Because it's it seems you know if if knight f3 can be so powerful for the number of options available for white to steal the game. 
Um, so B3 here appears actually as the fourth choice for white. 14, 48.3% over 22, 40 games, 2,240 games. So C4 the most popular, G3 second most popular, E4 third most popular. So all these chameleon options. But you also then get the fourth choice, B3, E3, C3, D4 is after that with 355, D3 222, Knight 1 to C3, 61 games, B4 11 games, a3 six games but anyway it's not that much of a rare bird to play b3 it's the fourth choice here with 2000 games now e4 is with 2240 games okay so the most most common is just c4 but b3 is is very interesting so black reacts with d5 statistically d5 is the third most popular move more popular knight c6 knight f6 D5 here is slightly less popular with D5. Um, so Fisher, Short, Tao, Timen have played D5. So Black is in good company at the moment with D5. On other moves, well, okay. Uh, let, let's carry on a bit. So E3 played here. Is this a sensible reply? It is the top reply to the move D5, betraying a dark square strategy, and maybe Bishop B5 is on the cards. 952 games played by Yermolinsky, Korshnoi, Timan. Second most popular, 535 games on my deck base, Bishop to B2. So we see E3. Then the most popular here is Knight C6, 493 games, Knight F6, 389, A6, 94. Okay, Bishop G4, 58. Black plays actually E6, which is down the list at fifth, 41 games. Sorry. No, no, e6 is later. Knight f6 is a popular move, play, played by Kramnik himself in a position at least once. Short tau. So that, that's fine as well. Okay, let's go, go on from bishop b2. That was the top choice. Was it e6 here? Is the second most popular choice in this position, e6. Only by a little bit to knight c6. So no big deal to play e6. Um, bishop g4 doesn't score that well. Um, with 147 games, it's got a 47.3 percent record. E6 is is not bad, 52.9. Top scoring statistically is just knight c6. Okay, so no problems so far. G3 is very very interesting. In fact, okay, statistically it's not played that much, but with with only 16 games being being played before, including Blackney and, and someone called IC45 before. I don't know if that's an online nickname. So G3 has been rarely played. Uh, we're talking about six choice down, interestingly. Um, that, that was the move here. So in this position, C4 the most common, 189. Bishop B5 second most common. D4 third most common, 172. Bishop E2, 160. Knight F3 to E5, 154. So G3 is actually a really rare bird statistically on my on my database here with just 16 games believe it or not 16 games Mo most people play C4 here so we're we're starting to be on much less theoretical territory after this move G3 okay now knight C6 has been played before 13 games Rogers grandmaster Rogers from Australia has played this that's the top choice here Bishop g2, top choice. Bishop e7, top choice. Castles, top choice. Castles, top choice. c4, in this position, to play c4, third choice. Spraggett, Blutney, and Goodman have played this before. b6, now b6 is interesting. That's the top choice. And we transpose it into more common territory. Colson's actually had this position before and played b6. It's the top choice now with 900. 98 games so we're in familiar territory again now by transposition knight 1 c3 top choice bishop b7 top choice cd top choice now here <clears throat> is where i mentioned knight d5 might be technically better in fact that is the top choice here to play knight d5 and colson nakamura short have all played knight d5 knight takes d5 before and you might think 
that's that's not a big deal surely well it is it is it is a big deal uh to to forcibly try to get this exchange of knights here i think to play knight takes d5 um for example a colson game uh if we can get uh a handle on this with uh just just review a colson game if we can in this position there's 255 games to check out uh, that was when Colson was 2786 against Ivanchuk. It was a draw in uh, 2008. But uh, basically, we saw knight takes d5 against Ivanchuk, queen takes d5, Colson playing black. d4, rook a d8, knight e5, queen d6. Anyway, it was eventually a draw, so that's a game to check out maybe in this. But um, e takes d5, okay, hasn't got such a good record. But apparently Karpov, still reasonably good company, Karpov, Ponomaryov have played e takes d5 before. d4 top choice. Knight e4. This is interesting. Third choice. Usually rook a c8 is played here. 62 games. Karpov has played this move rook a c8 in this position before. Uh, rook e8 second most popular, but knight e4 third most popular. Knight e4. A good score percentage though. Uh, Grandmaster Rogers has played this before. Okay, so we see D takes C5, top choice. Knight E takes C3, the absolute top choice here, to take here. Okay, so black playing B takes C5, top choice for the hanging points, not Bishop C5. Now the move Queen E2, and here's, here's like a sting on the end of the tail, because it seems... Queen e2 is quite a, a rare bird here statistically, and we're really out getting out of book, but it seems to have very clear um, ideas like queen b2, and we've only got one game here. I've only got one game here now. Hergot Jens, uh, Hergot's 2410, played in 1992. So this is starting to be quite a rare position now, finally, after queen e2. So let's end that theoretical survey. So here, black. We've got a game. So rook e8 is played. White white has small advantage out of the opening. Now queen b5. Why not just rook b8 rather than going in for losing the pawn, which seems to be completely disastrous. Rook b8. Let's let's have a look at rook b8. There's a slight advantage for white technically at this depth. If we go with rook a c one, bishop a eight. Let's put the queen on a four, because maybe the queen can shift over here later. What is my actually threatening in this position? Knight e one is one of the main threats to just pressure on d five, if given a chance. So if black tries to interfere with that and offer the a seven pawn. Starting to look a bit murky. This this sort of position. It's these pawns that are a bit fragile here. But um, maybe this is this is necessary because black here is only losing a flank pawn, not an important centre pawn. So possibly it's not as bad, but it's still an advantage for white. And here, if if he's losing the centre pawn in this position anyway. I don't know. It just seems it just seems White's maintaining a nagging advantage after Queen B five. It's even if Rook B eight, you know, the Queen coming here and then pressurizing D five after is a big problem for Black. So in the game, we saw what looks to be just going into basically a bad end game after the exchange of Queens by force. The engine really likes Rook D five going in for this. It's an exchange that basically for two pawns. It doesn't seem like such a bad deal on the surface of things. It's only if black can really do something with the rooks. But two pawns for the exchange, white's going to slowly just improve his position. Um, so bishop c3, forcing move, kicking the rook again, a4. It's all it's all pretty pretty logical to start making use of these pawns now off that rook eviction. I think the threat is just bishop. I would have assumed bishop c3, but 
other things may be okay. Rook d1, bishop a1, rook c1, king g2. Okay, there's no, there's no immediate need to play bishop c3, just other moves as well. Okay, so rook c7. Now, I think actually there is a clear tactical threat, to be honest. Bishop f2 for rook c2 check. Yes, there's a clear tactical threat which needs to be parried. So forget what I said in the first pass. The real reason for rook a2 tactically is is against uh, bishop f2, it seems. That's a principal thing to deal with. So rook a2 deals with that, protecting b2. And now the king even comes off that checking line. So counterplay is starting to be reduced f4 okay and there's a, there's a squeeze now now is there a threat of rook d5 possibly potentially check and it starts to get a bit dangerous so white's trying to deal with rook d5 here so he throws in uh, a5 okay now rook d5 here why wouldn't uh, that work i just think maybe this is too much of a distraction this a5 move E takes check taking on a5 here, otherwise that pawn's a bit of a runner. And where is black's play? In this position, I think that's that's quite a good rook and pawn ending. Um it's more difficult to ignore a5 for rook d5 here, it seems seems white's going to be fine after rook d5 here with king g4 apparently so there's, there's no real there's no real tactical amazingness like h5 at black's disposal so black plays b takes a5 okay white's using the b pawn now instead of the originally intended a pawn uh which the post-mortem discussion revealed that uh okay but this b pawn is is looking pretty strong no need to exchange off rooks. What would happen with a rook exchange here? Would it be that bad for white? Probably. So that would be right to keep the rook on in this position. It's far more dangerous to keep the rook on. And he's threatening concretely things like bishop f6 if the, if the rook ever moves off the sixth row. Okay, and he's starting to improve his position again because bishop d4. So maintaining uh, threats, you know, Black is tied to Hunter defending f6 here. Now b4 is is on the cards here, and it, it's not played immediately. Funny enough, okay. Even though the engine likes b4, he's just getting his king in. This is another way of playing position. h4, just sealing the king side first of any counterplay chances. b4 now attacking the rook. h5 sealing the counterplay on the king side now for good. Unless that pawn's removed later, but um, the D pawn, the B pawn rather, advance is is pretty remorseless here, and it finally doesn't matter at all in this position about the rook exchange. It's no big deal. Uh, a lot of damage is being done to Black's counterplay. The king can march in and help support uh, queen enabling uh, resources now. So the threat now coming up for Bishop D6. So Bishop C5 here, just for Bishop D6. Black resigning here. It's it's actually um, it's it's a positional masterpiece, and the opening is is really showing the huge power of Knight F3. There's there's uh, a number of alternative moves after Knight F3 against C5, which are really interesting for steering the game uh, potentially into a game totally uncomfortable for the opponent. A uh, remarkable game in in many positional respects, um, and especially the way counterplay was was reduced, uh, the refusal of the rook until the very point where the king could infiltrate. Uh, you know, keeping the rook on, I think, was fairly instructive. The two bishops keeping control of the position, uh, along with the pass pawn, to be the winning asset eventually. Well played, uh, Vladimir, and um, good experience for Garwin. Comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.